Well, hello everyone. We are in for this week's video. And as I mentioned last week, this video was going to hit at a topic that is very relevant in history to this week and even to a lot of people around the world because of the fascination with this historical event. And as of yesterday morning, it was it has now been officially 112 years since the sinking and disaster of the RMS Titanic out in the North Atlantic Ocean. It happened on the night of April 14th to 15th, 1912. I think the sinking of the Titanic really does not need a massive introduction to most people, as it's something that has retained its image within the popular memory for well over 112 years now, and it's not likely to go away anytime soon. So what I want to take a look at this week is not so much the history of the Titanic, at least not with the ship itself, but an aspect that I feel doesn't always get touched upon in many respects when you're talking about the history of the disaster and the sinking, but it, it is there. I mean, it does get touched upon a little bit, but there's not a whole lot of attention put on it as to more or less, you know, what happened during the actual sinking. I mean, there's a very little emphasis even you know, after the sinking, other than the news breaking around the world, but the survivors don't get a whole lot of credit, I don't think, until their testimonies years later for the time. I mean, the after effects, I don't think. I think they get more credit than this little event does. Say, like, the inquiries and the ship changes and regulations that were changed to, you know, better improve the safety on these ships. But what I want to look at this week is more or less, and as I mentioned last week, this is kind of a more dark topic in a way, but what about the efforts to retrieve the dead that from this great disaster that had occurred on that night? So, again, for those of you, if by the rare chance you are not familiar with the Titanic, which I, in this day and age is hard to believe, and for those of you who may just need a quick refresher or the basic laydown of what had occurred, the RMS Titanic was the brand new Ocean line was a brand new massive ocean liner that was put into service for the prominent British shipping company, the White Star Line. It was their second of this brand new class of ocean liners. It had a sister named RMS Olympic that was about a year older. And the Olympic class by White Star Line was meant to be a new class of ocean liner that, while they weren't the, exactly the fastest things on the transatlantic routes, they were supposed to be the most luxurious and the most comfortable that would allow passengers to not mind staying an extra day at sea and allow them to really take command of the oceanic uh, travel market. So the Titanic is launched in May of 1911. A year later, in April of 1912, it sets out on its maiden or very first voyage. This is the first time it's ever been out at sea. And it left Southampton, England on April 10th of 1912. And then it made further stops to pick up passengers and mail and even dropped off a couple at the ports of Cherbourg in France and at Queenstown, which is now Cobe, Ireland. And it set out ultimately with two, around 2,200 people on board, with its destination being the port of New York City. Unfortunately, as most of us know, and probably most of us remember, on the night of April 14th, the ship struck an iceberg at about 11.40 p.m. ship's time. I mean, we don't know exactly what we can't go off our own time frame because there is a time difference, so we say ship's time as to what time it was when the ship hit it, so what the ship's time was. And at 11.40 p.m., it hit an iceberg. It ended up being not the unsinkable legend that everyone was you know, purporting it was going to be because it had taken way too much damage. Just the extent of the damage made it impossible that the ship could even float. And two and a half hours later, at 2.20 in the morning on the April 15th, the ship's stern after having broken off in the bow and it finally went underwater and the Titanic was lost for 73 years until 1985. Of the 1,500 dead, nearly 1,500 dead, I think the technical number was 1,496, so pretty close. That's why we say 1,500. But of the 1,500 dead is what we'll go with, most died not from drowning but from exposure to to the freezing cold water that night. The water temperature that the Titanic sank in was only 28 degrees Fahrenheit. Had that been fresh water, it would already have been frozen over and be ice. But since this is salt water in the ocean, salt water has a much lower freezing point than fresh water. So keep that in mind. Had this been in, say, Lake Erie in Ohio, that would be frozen over at this point. That would That is cold enough to freeze fresh water. Fresh water's freezing point is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. This is lower than that. 
And in that kind of water, the human body has maybe 20 minutes to live before you die of hyperthermia, die of freezing to death, pretty much. Your body, and your internal core temperature just drops below and everything starts shutting down pretty much. So you had about 20 minutes. Most of the dead died in that fashion. I mean, if you go, and we're going to discuss this a little bit too, but I think one of the great ironies is if you go see the grave of a Titanic victim, most often their cause of death as listed on their death certificate or even on the on the gravestone might often, might often say something along accidental drowning. Well, they didn't technically drown in most cases. I mean, there sure certainly probably was a few, especially if you didn't have a life belt, because like, eventually once your arms give out, and your muscles give out, you're not going to be able to keep your head above the water anymore. But most people had a life belt. And if you had a life belt, you weren't going to, even if you stopped swimming, you weren't just going to sink. So it wasn't drowning that killed a majority of them. It was freezing to death, which is not really something that sounds as pleasant. Not that drowning is pleasant, but it sounds even more gruesome when you say that someone literally became a human icicle. 712 survivors were picked up by the Carpathia and then sent to New York City, and they arrived on Thursday, April 18th. Mind, this was Monday morning when they got picked up. So we know what happened with the survivors. They were picked up by a rescue ship about two hours after the ship had finally disappeared from the water. At, I think there were only around four or six people that ended up being plucked from the water, and two of them later died. So if it had been six, that meant four ultimately lived. They actually went down with the ship and uh, managed to actually come out of that water alive. And of course, there were also the weird instance of Collapsible B, which we have a photo of. Collapsible B was one of the lifeboats that, unfortunately, they tried to launch it right at the very end before the final plunge happened, and it landed upside. It was stored on top of the officer's quarters near the first funnel, and when it landed on the boat deck trying to get that thing down because they were try they were going to try to launch it through the davits the cranes what we would call the cranes that would actually lower the lifeboat unfortunately it landed upside down on the deck and before they could get it upright the ship suddenly took a massive plunge downward and washed that boat off the deck upside down and throughout the night there were about 40 some men clinging to the bottom of this thing trying to get out of the water it was not probably, it was not at all a pleasant experience that night for anyone that had to go in that water. As many survivors accounted, it felt like a thousand knives being plunged into your body the moment you came in contact with it. It was not, it wasn't, it wasn't just a cold. It was a stinging cold. It was a painful cold as soon as you went in that water. So what we're going to focus on here is more of what happens with the bodies, because we know that there are now approximately 1,500 dead people and quite a few of them are floating at the scene of this disaster. So as new, as soon as the news broke that the Titanic had sunk with a massive loss of life, which would have been approximately today because April 15th, many of the news newspapers back in the United States had just kind of got word that something was going on with the Titanic. The There was only one wireless station in the country that was able to uh, actually pick up Titanic's distress signals, and that was one on top of the Wanamaker department store in New York City. And they had only heard garbled transmissions and had to relay stuff through like Cape Race and other ships. And at the, it was just it was so late at night on the 14th when they got this that they already are starting getting ready to put out the next day's paper. So they were make, able to make a last minute edit saying that, you know, we detected that something is wrong. With the Titanic, something apparently has gone on. We're getting distress calls from her, and her last one was garbled. We don't know what happened. We don't have further news or confirmation at this point. It wasn't until April 16th that the first newspaper really came out that accurately predicted that Titanic had, yes, sunk. But unlike many newspapers that were trying to say, oh, she's being towed. Oh, everyone's safe. This newspaper correctly predicted it, although the numbers weren't entirely right that a majority of the passengers had, in fact, died and had not made it with a tragic loss of life, which ended up being true. But as soon as the news broke that there had been a massive loss of life and Titanic had sunk, White Star Line, the owner, owner of the Titanic, had chartered a cable ship, the Mackay Bennett, to out of Halifax, Nova Scotia, which was fairly close to Newfoundland because Titanic sank about 400 miles southeast of the coast of Newfoundland, off the Grand Banks, is where it hit the iceberg and ended up sinking. There had been an ice field there that night. So it's about 400 miles from land. There's no land, immediate land anywhere close. And Halifax is just a little bit to the southwest of Newfoundland, I would say. 
So the Mack K. Bennett is a cable ship that is then chartered by the White Star Line on the very same day, pretty much, that Titanic sinks later on April 15th to actually go out there and pick up and retrieve bo as many bodies as they can so that they can maybe be, you know, given back to family so they could be put to rest or whatever was going to happen with them. The undertaking part of this retrieval mission would be taken by the John Snow and Company, Co Morgan, Morg Company, that was hired to oversee the arrangements. The Mackay Bennett was loaded with supplies that included tons of ice, plenty of ice to ice down the bodies and keep them from, you know, starting the decomposition process, to slow the decomposition process. A hundred coffins and volunteer crewmen who were also being paid double for the job. The McKay Bennett would depart Halifax on April 17th at noon, and due to rough weather, it was not able to reach the site of the disaster until that Saturday on April 20th. In the meantime, before the McKay Bennett could actually arrive at the site of Titanic's sinking, there would be a grisly occurrence that would occur near the wreck site, unfortunately. Because after Titanic had gone down, there was a lot of wreckage. There's a lot of dead bodies floating around. There's anything that could, and also amongst the dead bodies, anything that could float off Titanic did. Anything wooden, anything that was not physically attached or bolted to the ship, in some cases even things that were, but anything that could possibly have come loose did. And this is floating amongst the bodies. So there's doors, there is all kinds of things. Benches, chairs, doors, uh, panels from the Grand Staircase. I think one account even said, and I believe it was from the Mackay Bennett, that they even found the ship's barber pole floating in the water that day when they got out there. But there was all kinds of wreckage and bodies, and it's a grisly scene. And many of the ships, after the confirm they had received the confirmation that the ship had indeed gone down and all survivors had been picked up, are transmitting the coordinates to each other, warning all other vessels that may not have heard yet to stay clear of this area because there is a mass of wreckage and you probably don't want to distress your passengers. Unfortunately, one ship did not quite get that message, and that ship's name was the Bremen, which ended up steaming straight through the wreckage site. And the passengers and crew ended up being massively distressed because as they went through this wreckage site, there they got to see over 100 bodies just floating in the water. The Bremen, one woman aboard the Bremen even noted how she had seen a mother clinging to a dead mother, of course, because at this point they're dead. I mean, these aren't survivors. And she had seen the body of a mother still clutching her newborn baby close to her breath, close to her breast, like trying to protect it. And they're frozen in that position, just bobbing up and down in the ocean. That She said that stayed with her for many, many years at, later after having seen that. The Mackay Bennett eventually arrived on Saturday, April 20th at around 8 p.m. at the wreck site. However, since it was already getting dark, they would not begin recovery operations until the following morning at 6 a.m. on the 21st. So at this point, it has been exactly one week since the disaster. These bodies have been at sea for a week. If you know the, how the process of the human body decaying is, it does not take long for a body to start decomposing, especially in ocean and especially in water. So after a whole week at sea, some of these bodies are going to be so decomposed and misfigured to the point that you can't even identify them. After it, It's that short. I mean, you pretty much have to take them as soon as they've died. Because if you leave them to the elements for a whole week, you not, it's going to be a lot harder to identify these bodies. And that's exactly what happens in most of the cases. 51 corpses were recovered the very first day that the Mackay Bennett started its recovery operations, along with any value. They also would remove any valuables that were found on the bodies when they recovered one, and they would also complete a body description of what the body looked like, and they would number it according to, you know, whatever number of body it was. So, like, this, bo this body was the fourth body that we found, so its designated number is going to be body number four. So that would be how they're going to do that. The Mackay Bennett did not directly go into the wreck area. It more or less kind of stayed just outside, and then it sent, like, skiff boats, like rowboats out there with crew members to actually go out there and pick them up the bodies as many as they could and then row them back to the Mackay Bennett where they could be embalmed or put on ice or, in some cases, buried at sea, as was going to have a lot of case for many of them. Many of the bodies, as we mentioned at this point, they're deteriorated beyond recognition after almost a week, pretty much a week at sea, and there's not really any hope of even trying to identify those bodies. That evening, 
on that first day, 24 of the 51 bodies, which were all unidentified crewmen, they could tell at least that they had been crewmen due to their uniforms, but they could not tell who they were, and there was no chance they were going to be able to with the technology at the time. That evening, 24 of the bodies, which were all crewmen, were placed in canvas bags, weighted down with iron grates, and then buried at sea. They had a chaplain on the Mackay Bennett to actually issue, you know, rites and last passages for the dead, like, like you would for a funeral. Yeah, pretty much for a funeral is what they were doing. So they made sure they had a chaplain on the ship, and the chaplain would do a short little message, and then they just, as one crew member on the Mackay Bennett said, it was just constant splash, splash. Splash, splash, one body after another is chucked over the side when they could not identify it and waited so they would sink. The fourth body of the first 51 had been a child of only two years of age, and this body would later become known as the Unknown Child, and we'll discuss who that actually is because we have found out who that was here in just a little bit. So that was just the fourth body. The fourth body that they found on the very first day was a two-year-old. That's a, that's quite sad in real reality. That that you go out there, you're retrieving dead, you think you're thinking, well, I know people died, but it's probably all adults and all that, and it, that doesn't hit you as hard as seeing that of a, pretty much a newborn frozen to death in the water. That that I think would hit anybody hard just as much as I mean, a frozen body, a frozen dead person is going to in any manner, but to see a child is a whole other manner entirely that didn't get to live out their life. One of the more prominent bodies that was found on that very first day was none other than John Jacob Astor the fourth. And John Jacob Astor had been the most one of the wealthiest men in the men in the world. He had been the most wealthy passenger on the Titanic. He had been coming back from a honeymoon with his newly wed nineteen year old wife. Mind you, the guy was forty seven years old. And his they were coming back from their honeymoon in Egypt. And she got into a boat. She got in lifeboat number four, I believe it was. Her name was Madeline. She was actually pregnant as well. And they would not let John Jacob Astor into the boat. He stayed back. And they did find his body on that very first day. So this would have been April 21st. And his body was crushed and covered in soot. It was, in many ways, Every bone in that body was broken, and they were able to identify his body mostly by the clothing that he wore, he the watch that he still had on his body, and he also had some diamond cufflinks on that also had his initials, and about $500 worth of 1912 money in his wallet that was on him. The fact that John Jacob Astor was covered in soot and most of his bones were crushed would tell us that he probably got killed by either when one of the one of the first or second funnels collapsed and probably fell on top of the man. And I'll show you exactly what... Because there are rumors that people who see John Jacob Astor uh, toward the bridge, which was the command of the ship. So here is a older model of the Titanic. This one I did years ago, and I want to redo one to know, now that I know I can do this much better than I did when I was a teenager. <laughs> but... The rumor was that John Jacob Astor, and I don't know how well this is going to show. Okay, I can kind of see it. He was somewhere up here. This was the bridge. This was where the captain and crew were commanding the ship. And somewhere up here, of course, we have some lifeboats up here. And that would have been right here as well. I'm trying to think of how this works with my fingers. So he would have been somewhere up near here. Some people said they seen him with the captain. Others de debated that. But the fact that his body was covered with soot and crushed tells us that as the ship was going down, we do know from eyewitness accounts and many eyewitness accounts, I mean, the breakup is still controversial about exactly where that happened and when that happened because it was so dark and some people didn't see it and some people did, but everyone saw what the funnels did. The, as the water got up to the base of the first funnel here, as the ship took its final plunge, this funnel ended up falling over. It missed one of the collapsible B lifeboat by just mere feet. And then mind you, these are 62 foot tall funnels. These are not small things at all. And there were accounts that people got not only crushed by them when they fell, but there were also accounts that now that there's a gaping hole where the funnel stood in the boat deck, that's about quite a, quite a few feet wide, there were people that were now sucked back into the ship, which is probably the most horrifying fate of all to be sucked back into the ship, down into the very bottom of this thing as it's going down. And there were accounts that some people did get sucked back in. But this funnel fell, 
this one fell, and then the third didn't fall until the breakup, because suppose we do know the breakup probably happened probably right in front of the third. And then the reports that the fourth actually survived the breakup and then actually didn't come down until the stern started taking its plunge. But most likely, John Jacob Astor, from what we know, died when one of these two funnels fell on top of the man. And that's actually kind of dark. <laughs> As more bodies were identified, names were sent back to shore via wireless to families that, you know, we found your relative's body and we're going to be take. if anyone could cl wants to claim it, we're going to be taking it to this point. You can come and claim it there and take it home. And some would, some of the bodies would await identification in Halifax aboard the Mackay Bennett. The unfortunate problem that complicated the recovery operation for the bodies for the Titanic was that the ocean currents had actually spread the bodies and wreckage in the course over a week over hundreds of square miles. And ships were now seeing bodies and wreckage for weeks after in places that were miles away from where the ship had originally gone down. we got to keep in mind that just because the water was calm the night the Titanic sank doesn't mean it stayed calm and it doesn't mean the currents weren't flowing. So initially, everything was in one spot, but as the time goes longer away from the initial incident, things start getting drifting away and carried off. And although there were wreckage, there was wreckage and bodies being seen for sh by ships for weeks and even, uh, I'd say, about a month and a half after this disaster, none of those ships stopped to retrieve any bodies that they saw. They just said, oh, yeah, we've seen this. Well, did you think to pick it up and put it somewhere? <laughs> Like, someone might like have buried their family member if you could identify them. And I ought to show this while we're close enough to that topic with the other two here. So, let's see here. Yeah, these would be uh, viable. And that one, not so much yet. Well, these ones... Where is that man at? I got a picture of him. Uh, so this is a picture of John Jacob Astor that was taken about 1909. This was him. This was the richest man on the ship. They found his body on the very first day of recovery. And he did get a burial back, I think, in May of 1912. The, the Astor family did end up burying him. But that was him. Here is a kind of a darker picture. This is one of the skim boats out rowing at the scene of disaster, and I don't know how well you're going to be able to see it, but as you can see, they're picking. That's a body that they're picking up with a life jacket still on the body that they're picking up in the ocean after the disaster. Then here we have on board the Mackay Bennett where we can see some of the it looks like the coffins kind of it looks like cardboard it looks like the wooden boxes that I'm guessing may have been the coffins but they're actually embalming one of the bodies on the deck of the Mackay Bennett that they've recovered and over here are some looks like empty that don't look like there's anything in them this was not a uh, pleasant task by any means I mean you've got a lot of dead people and this is gripping the world at this point, and there's a lot of pressure on this crew. Even though they're getting paid double and they're all volunteers, there's a lot of pressure on them to recover as many of the bodies as they can because there's a lot of families who are going to want them. In the case of the wealthy passengers, in some, many of their bodies would be kind of prioritized because they're going to be needed to settle estates and wills and everything else. So they're definitely kind of demanding the bodies. I think for John Jacob Astor's body, I believe there was like a 200, $200 or $250,000 reward put up by the Astor family for anyone that could, you know, retrieve John Jacob Astor's body and bring it back home. They did, the crew of the Mackay Bennett, I think, eventually got a $100,000 reward, which they used, they split between themselves, amongst themselves, and they had used a good portion of that money to pay for a particular grave, the one for the unknown child. Here is a picture of the Mackay Bennett, what the ship looked like. So this was a cable ship that was just chartered by the White Star Line to go out there and actually retrieve bodies. This picture was taken about 1900. I don't believe the ship was scrapped until 65. 
during World War II. It was actually laid up in England and got bombed out by the German Air Force, but they ended up refloating it. But it's most famous for being the body recovery ship that recovered the most of the Titanic victims. It, ultimately, I think they covered 300 and some bodies was recovered by the ship. And then here we have... I, I mentioned how the one lifeboat collapsible B was one of the two lifeboats that didn't really get to be launched. It kind of got washed off the deck upside down. And here, a week after the disaster, the one of the rope, one of the skim boats from the Mackay Bennett, as they're retrieving bodies, they actually found collapsible B still floating at sea. And that's the boat right there that had about 40 people clinging to it the night of the disaster. And it was still floating out of the sea. They tried to recover it, but they just couldn't get it. And as far as I know, it is the only lifeboat of Titanic that was never actually recovered and probably rotted out in the ocean. And collapsible B, when I say that it landed upside down, it was in Army officers' quarters. And I do have it represented on this model. I just don't have the other two collapsibles, uh, D and C, which I kind of hate that it doesn't. But if you kind of look, I don't know how well it's going to come up. But you see on either side of the first funnel, there's a boat here and there's a boat here. These were the collapsibles. They're stored on the top of the officers' quarters. So they had to be brought down, and they tried to use oars as ramps to try to slide these things off there. And unfortunately, when they did it with B, the oars snapped, and the thing landed upside down. And I believe, if I'm correct, it is the one on this side, I think, that is B. I believe it's this one that was... No? I'm thinking of it. I'm trying to think of how they did this. In most depictions, I see B off over here, so I'm going to say it was probably this one. I'm trying to think if that would make right. I'm trying to think how this is appearing. Yeah, I'm pointing to the right one on my side, but I don't think it's looking like that here. <laughs> Try to put it over here, maybe. Yeah, because it's flipped on this screen to me. <laughs> it is flipped, the vantage point, so it's, like, confusing to see. But one of those two boats is my point, that one of these was collapsible B, and it got landed on the boat deck upside down, and then when this started plunging, it just went and floated off. But this was that boat about a week after. Still floating at sea. Okay. So on April 21st, so the very first day, McKay Bennett ends up retrieving a total of uh, quite a few bodies. And they ended up wiring on that very same day. They realized that we're going to have more bodies here that we can actually handle. So we need another ship out here. And they wired for help, which led to another cable ship called the Menia would, to leave Halifax with more coffins and supplies. And this was the, the Menia. This was the other cable ship that was sent out to help the Mackay Bennett retrieve more bodies. By April 23rd, two days later, Mackay Bennett had about 80 bodies on board, with another 87 being recovered the very next day. So when the Menia arrived on April 26th, the Mackay Bennett then finally departed from the scene of the disaster, and all she had recovered 306 bodies out of the 1,496, and 116 of those 306 were buried at sea because they were unidentifiable. 100 were in coffins, and the rest were in canvas bags below deck on ice. Class structure, very peculiarly, peculiarly was actually maintained even in death. Crew member bodies were kept on the open deck and iced down, but they were not embalmed or even prepared. They were just pretty much kept on ice to keep them from, you know, decomposing any further. Second and third class bodies were typically placed in canvas bags, and most of them remained unidentified. And first class bodies were fully embalmed in most cases, placed in coffins, and most of them were identified because identification would be needed to settle estates, as we mentioned before. 
for the bodies that, of course, couldn't be identified, which were majority crew members and third class passengers, they were simply thrown in a canvas bag, weighted down, and given a burial at sea. The Minya recovered only 15 bodies after the Mackay Bennett before bad weather ended up setting in. And part of this reason why you might ask, like, okay, so even before bad weather set in, why was it only 15 when the Mackay Bennett just found 306? Because as we mentioned before, with every day, the currents are taking those bodies further and further apart. It's getting harder and harder to find these bodies without going within a 100 or 200 mile search, search, big old circle to even find them. So by the time Menia gets out there, it's been almost two weeks. And at this point, the bodies are way dispersed at this point. And Menia only manages to pick up another 15. One of the few prominent ones that she was able to find and actually identify was that of Charles M. Hayes, who was had been the president of the Grand Trunk Railroad in Canada. Most of the bodies after this point were lost to the Gulf Stream and never seen again. After returning to Halifax, the Mackay Bennett unloaded 190 bodies at the coal wharf there. The police kept onlookers and photographers away, except for one photographer who managed to get a quick picture in, and because the police found out that he had taken a picture, they confiscated his camera. I believe uh, there was a certain picture, I can't remember if it was on the Mackay Bennett or if it was maybe a picture taken by a photographer in Halifax, but it went up for auction a couple of years ago, and it sold for quite a bit of money. <laughs> Just a picture because of what it contained in that picture. To store the bodies that had been brought back to Halifax, a curling rink was set up as a morgue and the bodies were embalmed. They were arranged in cubicles so that family and friends could come and try to identify the bodies. If they could identify them, they were free to take them home and bring them home for burial. For though they were given about two weeks, the bodies would be kept there for two weeks for families and friends to come and try to identify and claim, and death certificates were also prepared, which as we mentioned before, most of them were mentioned accidental drowning at this Titanic at sea, even though that is not correct for the fact that this is not Titanic, and most people are just joking about that this type of thing. Bodies that did not get claimed after two weeks in Halifax were buried at the three at three different cemeteries within the city based upon what their known religion was or what their assumed religion was. And there were some mistakes made. For example, Mitchell, Mitchell Navarro, which he went by the, uh, the name of uh, Mr. Hoffman on the ship because he was actually – he had kidnapped his two young children – and he was going back to the United States. He had kidnapped his two, his two children, his two young boys, from his estranged wife and was traveling under this assumed name. He got very lucky in terms of with his boys because it was literally collapsible. D. It was the last boat to actually get successfully launched on the ship before the final plunge began. And although he could not get into the boat, he was able to hand his two young sons. One was two – or I can't remember. One was two, and I think the other was four handed them off to a woman in the boat. He did not make it, but they did find his body. And uh, he was actually Catholic by nature. He had been a Frenchman, but they buried him in the Jewish cemetery. So there was a mistake made there. The crew of the Mackay Bennett took personal responsibility and used some of that reward money from finding John Jacob Astor's body toward paying for a marker for the then unknown child that they had found, body number four of that two-year-old. And let me see here. There was something. Another prominent body I did not mention that they did happen to find was band leader Wallace Hartley. Wallace Hartley had been what, the main leader of Titanic's orchestra. He had been the one playing the violin that if you've watched any of the Titanic movies, you've probably seen him kind of – he's very – when you see the scenes of the band, he's very much the one in charge. He's always playing the violin, and he's usually depicted as the one starting the last song of Nearer Thy God to Thee, which is debated whether or not that was the last song. But they did find his body, and surprisingly, his body – he still even had his violin strapped onto him in its case. And they were able to retrieve that and send it back home to England for burial. And I think a couple of years ago, his violin actually went up to auction and it sold for quite a, I think it was a couple billion, if I'm not wrong, but it was quite a bit. So the last operations that ended up being undertaken were kind of minor. Another ship, Mont Montmagny, 
recovered another four bodies after Menia departed in the early weeks of May of 1912. The ship Algerine found one more on May 14th. In mid-June, the White Star Line's other, another White Star Ocean Liner, the Oceanic, found Collapsible A, one of the other, the other of the lifeboats that had floated off that night, had been washed off. Mind you, this is in June. It's been about, it's been two months since the sinking, and this boat's still been floating out of sea. And it was found by the Oceanic on its way back to New York, over 200 miles away from the wreck site. And it still had three bodies in it of people where collapsible A did not go upside down, but when it was launched, when it washed off the ship, no one had quite put the plug into the bottom of the boat. So it was half swamped with water. And there were some people in collapsible A, but unfortunately, due to the fact that they were still exposed to the water up to at least their knees, they pretty much, there were at least three people that when they finally got picked up by another lifeboat, they were three people that had already died in the boat from exposure, and the bodies were left there that night after they had transferred the remaining surviving passengers into a boat that wasn't swamped. And it still had the three bodies in it after two months at sea, so I cannot imagine what th that would have looked like. I don't even want to think of what that would have looked like. Oh, I don't even want to think about that would have smelled like. But thank goodness for the Oceanic's sake that the Oceanic did rec they did recover the bodies as far as I am aware, I don't actually, I don't think they recovered the bodies. I think they buried them at sea, if I'm correct, because they would have been probably completely unidentifiable at that point. But the bodies, as far as I'm aware, were buried at sea, and then they did take the lifeboat back to New York. June was also the last month in which any bodies were recovered from the Titanic. The last body to actually be recovered and buried and actually identified was that of steward James McGrady. He was body number three hundred in. He was body number three hundred and twenty-eight, and he was buried in Halifax on May twenty-second. Three hundred and twenty-eight bodies overall were recovered during the recovery operations. One hundred and nineteen of them were buried at sea. Fifty-nine of the two hundred and nine were brought to Halifax, were claimed, and the remainder were buried there in Halifax, which is one reason I would like to go to that city at some point in my life. I would like to go see these graves. We do have at least one victim, I believe, up in Toledo that was buried, but I haven't been up there to see it. The only grave that I've seen related to the Titanic is a survivor's grave in Ashland. And that was that of Frank Goldsmith and his mother. I've seen their graves. But they, of course, they survived. Frank, I think, was only nine years old when he was on the ship. But he lost his father, unfortunately. And there were 128 bodies that were never identified that were buried. But they, the stones have a space for a name if one is ever discovered. And the graves are marked by body number if they do not have a name. And that... Every, and that was the case with the unknown child until fairly recently. So I'll show these other last pictures here. So here is an image of Collapsible A when Oceanic found it in June of 1912, after two months at sea. At this point, they've taken the bodies out of it, of course, but this is what the boat looked like. This one had been the other Collapsible that had not landed upside down, but had been half swamped on the night of the sinking. And then for the unknown child, this was the grave marker prior to 2000, I believe it was 2007 or 2008, but this was prior to that. This, I think, was in 2002 is when this one was taken. This was the marker that the Mackay Bennett's crew paid for for this two-year-old body that they found that they couldn't find out who he belonged to. So erected to the memory of an unknown child whose remains were just recovered after the disaster to the Titanic on April 15, 1912. In 2007 or 2008, I can't remember which particular year it was, they were doing some DNA testing on this body to try to identify it, and they came up with a match. The mitochondrial DNA test pr kind of revealed that it was the name of the child had been Sidney Goodwin. The Goodwin family had been a family that was on the ship. They were traveling third class. There is a wider picture of them. I just don't have it on me at the moment, but the picture doesn't have Sidney in it. Sydney was the youngest member of the family. There were their two parents, and I believe there was at least three boys or and three or four girls, and then you had Sydney. So there was quite it was a large family, and unfortunately, the whole family perished. None of the, none of the children or well, the parents made it. And even more sad is that Sydney. Now that we know that this two year old body was his, 
he is also the only member of his family that we have found a physical remain of. None of the other family members' bodies were ever found, indicating that they might have sunk with the ship, and maybe somehow Sydney's came free. I hate to say that, but maybe it somehow managed to come up. But the other family members were never found. So he is also the only member of his family that has been recovered. And this is a picture of that two-year-old child in 1911, about a year before the disaster, and what he would look like. So that was him. This was the two-year-old Sidney Goodwin, who we now, as of 2008 or 2007, we identify that he was the unknown child that we had buried in Halifax. And now, if you go to the grave now, that marker's still there, but now below it, they have a name plaque saying Sidney Goodwin on it as well. And it's very common tradition that people will leave, like, baby toys and stuffed animals at the side of this child's grave. One of Titanic's youngest victims, unfortunately. And this here is two pictures of the Fairview Lawn Cemetery in Halifax that has well over 100 victims of the Titanic's graves that you can go see. Right here is a sign actually saying Titanic grave site. These right here are the graves, just lined up. Good hand, Mind you, there's three different cemeteries in the city that have them, but this is the most prominent. And these are those same graves if you look up close. As we can see, these ones actually look like they have some names. So like Alfred Diebel, uh, Reginald Fenton, I see, O.W. O. W. Sam Samuel. And it says if they have an age that they died in, it will say that. Otherwise, it does have a death date. And they're just lined up. These were bodies that were recovered, and they were buried in Halifax after not being claimed by anybody. So that concludes for this week's video. So very unfortunately, this year marks 112 years since this big ship plowed itself into the bottom of the North Atlantic and killed one, almost 1,500 people. And even to this day, it's... But I just wanted to cover that because that's not really a aspect of the disaster I think gets a lot of attention as compared to some of the other ones. So in a way of kind of a memory of the dead, so to speak, that unfortunately perished that night. So that ends it for this video. So I do not know what we're going to be doing next week yet, so we'll get to that when we get to it. I do know that when we do our next uh, president video, which I'm trying to do one one a month, I might try to do two back to back with this next one just because with James Garfield getting assassinated and then Chester Arthur immediately finishing out his term, it, it just makes sense in my mind to maybe do them back to back just to cover that what would be one presidential term and get that done and over with. So we'll see. That might be where we go to next just to close out April. But. Otherwise, that completes our video for this week. So any comments, any questions, any anything you guys want to add or say, feel free to put that in the comment section below, and I'll be sure to go through it. So otherwise, hopefully everyone has a good remainder of the week. The weather has been mostly pleasant, other than the fact that if you're a person like me, you remember what happened 112 years ago this week or 159 years ago. We had Abraham Lincoln get shot and killed. So this is just not a good week historically. And even now, I mean, we had tax day Monday, and we know that's a big trouble for a lot of people. <laughs> but so hopefully everyone has a good remainder of the week, and we'll see you all back here next week for our next video. So until then, everyone stay well.